So uh, there's a very, very famous uh, uh, magician uh, by the name of uh, David Berglas. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before. Uh, but he would do uh, a very fascinating trick. Uh, and the trick would uh, involve a, a thought of card, completely random thought of card, and a completely thought of uh, random number. Uh, a random number thought of, and uh, and a deck of cards that was shuffled inside of a, uh, the case. So we have a shuffled deck sitting inside of the case. Uh, and the experiment would go as this. Uh, the, they would take the, the deck out. Uh, somebody else would take it out. Uh, not, not the performer. And uh, inside of the uh, deck, without shuffling it, without cutting it, without doing anything else, uh, they would locate a card at a number. So we need to get a card, and you're thinking of what card are you thinking of for us? The two of spades, thank you very much. Uh, and we need a number, so ma'am, what, what number were you thinking of for us? 18. So we have the two of spades at the 18th card out of a, a deck of 52. So I would need someone to uh, deal this out. So without cutting, without shuffling, without doing anything, we would count out from the top very cleanly. In fact, we'll do it face up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 17, and this is the 18th card, and what uh, card are you thinking of? The two of spades. Two of spades. That is any card at any number, completely random card at a completely random number uh, from a shuffled deck. This is the Common Magician uh, with a tutorial. This is going to be a comprehensive tutorial um, I have a number of um, videos that I've had up on my channel concerning any card at any number. Uh, and uh, I had one somewhat comprehensive discussion about it, and I resolved uh, to a particular way to perform it. And uh, people didn't really like that very much. It's one of the most disliked videos that I have on my channel. So, um, And I have a couple of other iterations uh, and variations of the effect on there as well. And I'm going to take them all down. I've removed all of those because I'm going to kind of cover a lot of that stuff again here. But I realize that I have a video that is a, a, a comprehensive look a lot of the more popular ways to perform a triumph routine. I have a, a video on triumph that's fairly thorough. And I have a couple of videos on ace cutting uh, on my channel as well uh, that are fairly comprehensive. Uh, but I don't have anything on there apart from that first video, that one that isn't appreciated very much. I don't have uh, uh, really any coverage on this particular effect. And this is probably one of the most popular effects uh, to uh, prepare for, to learn, and to, um, I guess, try to find a secret to or a method to. Uh, so I'm going to do that here for you today. Now, you saw a performance of it. I just gave you a performance, and I want to tell you that what you saw was genuine. It was real. Uh, those were um, randomized items, a, a card and a number. Now, I'm going to tell you how I did it, uh, and we're going to cover that method here in a minute. Um, and I don't want you to be disappointed, uh, but inevitably some of you will. And, and that's because a lot of you out there may be looking for real magic. And uh, there's, there's, I hate to tell you, there's no such thing as real magic. Uh, there, these are all illusions. These are tricks. We have to find methods that can give the appearance of something impossible. Uh, and what you saw appeared to be impossible. And Given what you saw, it is impossible. It's not really possible to do that. And that's the idea. So uh, if I was going to perform this on a video, uh, say in, with people at, in a restaurant or something in front of people, and I was going to record it and I was going to post it on a channel, I would perform it exactly as you just saw, and I would post it like that. Uh, if I was going to do it on television, I would definitely perform it the way that you just saw. 
uh, and there would be a lot of engineering going into that, and we'll discuss that. Uh, in fact, I think I've seen, we've all seen some of these television performances of uh, uh, the Berglas effect, any card, any number, which seem as impossible as what you just saw. It seems just as clean, just as impossible. Uh, and I'm convinced that uh, one of a couple of different methods is probably used, and, and, and probably the method that I just presented to you would be uh, one of those kind of variations uh, to accomplish that. And the idea there is that if you do something like that on television, if it's recorded in front of people on television and can appear as it does, uh, you can become a legend uh, just from that one performance. So um, if I was going to do it that way, I would do it the way that you just saw. That being said, I don't ever perform it that way. I actually perform it a lot of a, a couple of different ways uh, that you probably will find unsatisfactory uh, for people. Uh, and I probably wouldn't do it the way that you saw. You'll see why here in a little bit when we get to it. Uh, but I usually do uh, a method that violates a number of the principles uh, where I would be handling the deck at some point um, and... Uh, you know, we'll get into some of those uh, sleight of hand options here in a little bit. Uh, again, this is going to be a comprehensive video, and I want to talk about uh, the various different ways to accomplish the same effect. Uh, even though all of these methods are entirely different from each other, the idea is that you can get to a presentation of an effect that seems uh, legitimate and to a lay spectator would be completely passable as a, a card miracle. Uh, so with that little introduction, uh, let's talk about some of the philosophical uh, issues surrounding the uh, trick and some of the uh, terms that we use to discuss the effect before we get into uh, some of the methods that are at work in, in many of the pre presentations of any card at any number. Okay, so first of all, we need to have a short discussion on terminology. I've actually taken quite a few notes on this, and I'll be referring to a notebook with a lot of different ideas on it. I've done a lot of uh, thinking uh, in preparation for this uh, uh, video here, so I'll refer to uh, my notes as I go along. Um, terminology. I just want to address a couple of things here that are a little bit controversial for, for magicians, and some of you are going to disagree with me and put up a bunch of comments on there uh, uh, defaming me and my family uh, and my ancestors for saying this, but any card at any number, A-C-A-A-N, A-C-A-N, uh, is equal to C-A-A-N, that is card at any number, or A card at any number. So, any card at any number and card at any number actually mean the same thing. And, and most of you out there make this distinction. A lot of magicians in particular will make a distinction between the two. Uh, and that is really nonsense. It really is. And, and let me just explain it to you like this. Um, and I'll explain why. I'll explain why we think this way, because there's a reason why uh, people make that distinction, and I'll, I'll get to that. But I just want to give this to you to, to chew on for a moment, and, and we need to kind of set aside these differences here, because ultimately when you want to perform this effect, it's going to be about the way you present it in order to accomplish it uh, in a way that satisfies the rules, and there's some rules to this. So um, if I have a deck of cards and I say pick any card, you are picking any card. That's any card, okay? And you would be selecting it. Any card. Pick any card. Okay? If I say, think of a card, you can think of any card out of 52. There's no difference. Okay? The, 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 there's no difference in terms of the possibilities of selection. Now, what is different is the control of the selection. Okay, so in one, in one instance, you can pick any card, but you don't have control over which card you pick in terms of what it ends up being. You have control over uh, a variety of numbers. You have control over the number, you know, 1 through 52, and taking that card, but you don't have control over what it is. That is up to the deck itself and how it is uh shuffled. So this case being I've taken this card, uh, but the deck tells me that this card is the Ace of Hearts. That doesn't change the fact, however, as I said, that I had a selection of any card. Any card. Okay? It's not a card. It is any card. Um, and that's the distinction. Now, if I said think 
of a card, you could think of any card that's in there without having to be limited to the deck deciding on what card you are selecting. Now, if I did this, so we have pick a card, pick any card. We have think of any card, both of them meaning any card. Uh, however, there's a distinction in control. If I did this, and I said, go ahead and think of any card. Okay, what we have here is essentially the same thing as the beginning where I have all of the options out here, and your mind or your fingers, if you took it out, could zero in on any one of these. Okay. In fact, let me rephrase it. I could say, instead of think of any card, I could say pick a card. And if I show them to you in this way, what you end up at is think of any card. It's the same thing. Okay. And the reason why they become the same is because the deck does not decide the outcome in cooperation with your choice. Your choice is the, uh, is the complete decider. Your choice decides the outcome because you have all of the options and you can see what they are. And you can say, well, I like the Ten of Clubs and reach in and take the Ten of Clubs. Uh, and you can see where it's at and you can have that choice. Okay, So that is the distinction. And, th and this is what people get hung up on. When they say any card at any number, what they're, what they're actually referring to is not the true choice of any card. They're talking about control. Does the spectator have control over what the card is? Does the spectator have control over their decision? Um, oftentimes in the uh, realm of video, when we see, you know, presentations of this trick, uh, especially the ones that look more impossible, a lot like the one that I showed you, there is an assumption in there that uh, a decision has been made uh, and that it was absolutely free and all of the control in the decision uh, was on the spectator. Uh, and that's not necessarily true in some of those presentations. We'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a while here, okay? Um, but again, when you're making this distinction about any card at any number or card at any number, there is a misunderstanding in terms. Um, what you really are making a distinction, a distinction about is a thought of card at any number as opposed to a picked card at any number, and there's even a converse to this. It's funny to me that we get hung up on the card part of it, but we don't get hung up on the number part of it. Why couldn't it be a thought of card at a picked number, right? Um, or a you know a, a any card at a a thought of number, or any card at a selected number. I mean, there's a there's a sense in which the number itself can be controlled by someone other than the spectator under certain circumstances. But we don't seem to think about it that way. And if you really want to find a good way to present this effect, you should be thinking about both sides of it, not just the card, but also the number and the control and where the control lies. So I know that that might seem like a, a silly conversation to have, but it's really, really, really important when trying to find uh, your favorite or your best way to perform this effect. So. Just to recap, any card at any number and card at any number are actually the same thing. There is no distinction. The distinction between the two is not about the card. It's about the control. It's about the control that the spectator has in the outcome. Is it a partial control or is it a total control? If a spectator is choosing any card or, or, or seems to be choosing any card out of 52, it is still any card because the selection is available to any one of the cards. What they don't have control over is what the deck has decided about their selection in picking the card out. When they're thinking of a card, they still have the same options. There's one in 52 choices, but the difference is that the a spectator has control over what the identity of the card is without the deck deciding it. Uh, and then also in thinking about that, if I have somebody select or think of a card from a, uh, a, a spread deck, it is no different than if I have a, a person think of a card apart from the deck. So my telling them to think of any card one out of 52, uh, any one of the cards in the deck, 
uh, their, their choice in thinking is no different than if I spread the cards out in front of them and have them uh, pick one uh, to, to think about or to take out of the deck. There's no difference between those two. Both of those are a thought of card, uh, and merely spreading the deck and having them choose from face up is not a picked card as opposed to a thought of card. They are the same. Thought of card uh, and a selected card become the same when the faces can be seen. So just keep that in mind as we go through our options in uh, this presentation uh, and the various ways to accomplish this feat, uh, that we can uh, keep the rules without any violation uh, by understanding the terms. Okay, so that was one um, a philosophical uh, discussion in terms that I think we needed to have. Uh, so any card versus a card you know, don't be so critical uh, about that distinction and don't uh, be so quick to discount a number of methods and tutorials that you see online or things that people share that you find in books or that you find in uh, uh, DVD tutorials that you purchase or whatever the case may be, wherever you get your magic. Uh, don't, don't be so critical in making that distinction because the distinction is very, very minute and it's often misplaced and misunderstood when it is made anyway. Okay, uh, so that's the discussion. Let's move on uh, with the trick and its parameters. Okay, so the Burgos effect, any card of any number, uh, has a number of parameters. Uh, one of them, the first one, if we kind of put them in a cr chronology of events, is that there is a shuffled deck uh, that is, uh, you know, in a box or otherwise not touched by the performer. So you begin with a shuffled deck. Um, now, I'll say before I move on that in order to really perform this, you're going to have to violate one of these principles. And the key is, can you violate it in a way that is not apparent or is completely hidden? Uh, can you disguise your violation so that it is unseen and uh, the secret lies in that violation, um, but the violation is not otherwise known? The irony in this is that the most popular mind-blowing ways to perform this effect that rely on a shuffled deck violate the first principle because the fact that the deck is shuffled is never proven. Right. So if I have a, a card box uh, and the card box has has the uh, cards in it. Right. And I have that sitting out there at the beginning of the trick. And I say I have a shuffled deck and I have a spectator take the cards out and they count through uh, uh, on a, a selected number to a card that is thought of or selected. The one thing that I haven't proven is that it was shuffled. That's an assumption that is made. And it's just the fact that the spec that the uh, performer didn't touch the box makes it apparently uh, null and void, the fact that it may not have been shuffled, okay? So just keep that in mind. Some of the very best versions of the trick violate the first principle. Um, so the first principle is that it is a shuffled deck. Shuffled deck may be in the box, but not otherwise in control of the performer. The second element is that a card is uh, selected freely such that uh, the spectator has total control over their choice. So we talked about that distinction of control uh, and the uh, complexity in the uh, uh, terms any card at any number or a card at any number, uh, and that the distinction is in the control of selection and the outcome of selection. The uh, Burglass effect uh, assumes that a spectator truly could have selected any card as their choice uh, to locate. Okay. The third uh, element is that a number is thought of, freely thought of, that a number is selected freely uh, and that there is no uh, kind of influence on that number, that 1 through 52 can be selected freely. Uh, and then the uh, f uh, fourth element is that, again, uh, this is uh, kind of uh, playing off of the very first one, the uh, cards are not handled by the performer. Okay. And then the fifth one is that the cards, if possible, can be dealt face up so that you can expose the cards at the end. So those are the parameters. Um, next, we're going to talk about uh, some of the presentations of this effect and the differences. 
So let's have a discussion about some of the uh, presentations that are, are out there of this effect uh, and some of the uh, more miraculous looking ones and then some of the uh, uh, presentations that may be more personal uh, done for a, a small group of people or a, a, a lone spectator, which may not seem as miraculous, but, but honestly, in, that, in, in the context, can seem just as amazing. Um, so first of all, I want to just explain that this effect is essentially merely a force. The effect of any card at any number is a force of some kind, uh, and it will operate as a force. So it is a card force in one way or another, uh, in some manner. There is a force going on. And all versions of the effect operate on a force. So there's good news in this, because if you know some forces, if you know how to force a card, uh, you can already perform, uh, probably, if you think about it, you can perform any card at any number uh, right now. Uh, just understanding that principle. If you know of uh, several forces, then you're even better off. You're probably even more likely to be able to perform this effect somehow. Uh, the key is to perform your force at a, a manner in such a way at a time uh, that it is not detected uh, and that it is not understood as being a method uh, for the effect. So it is a force. Now, how is it a force? Well, there's a sense in which you can be forcing or you must be forcing the outcome of the card being at a particular number. So you're forcing a card by having it arrive or appear to arrive at a particular place. And that place is supposed to be a place that is chosen by someone other than the performer. So that being said, either you can mechanically force the outcome or you can psychologically force the elements that cause the outcome. And what that means is that if you have a particular card that is to appear, you could have control over the card itself having been forced, the selection itself. Uh, likewise, you can have some control over the number having been forced. There may be even a sense in which you have control over all three elements being forced. That is, that you forced a card at a location, that you it is placed there, uh, and you are forcing the card to be thought of, and you are forcing the number to be thought of. There is a possibility that you could do that. Uh, again, we'll talk about these methods here in a little bit, but it's important you understand that any card at any number is a force. It is just a card force. That's all it is. Okay, so knowing a force means that you can uh, uh, perform this in some manner. Um, now, really, what the effect hinges on is what the spectator experiences in the force. What is the experience of the spectator? Because experience of the effect is everything. How does the spectator participate in it? And what, what is it that they recall about the effect when they walk away? When they go tell somebody what you did, how do they recall it and how do they describe it? What is the uh, experience of the effect as they remember it? That is what our greatest concern is, uh, and that is really what we're after. And if we can get multiple people to uh, corroborate their experience, we're even better off. So if we can engineer our performance in such a way that you have five people telling the same impossible story, uh, then the trick is even better. Now, if you perform it in such a way that five people tell the story a little bit differently and they notice different things about it, then the trick can fall apart. Okay, so you want to engineer your effect to give the most impossible experience that can be recalled by the greatest number of spectators that saw it. Okay, and that's why I wouldn't perform what you saw at the beginning typically for people. Um, now, that's a good way to do it, and I'll show you a lot more. There's a lot more to be seen about it. Uh, I'm hiding a little bit there. Um, but, but in essence, the experience that a spectator walks away with can be what you saw in the video and nothing more than that. And that's the goal. You want them to tell the story. I saw a magician. He had uh, a deck of playing cards that was shuffled, 
and a, a, a type of card was named, a, a number in suit, and a number was uh, random, randomly uh, picked and named, uh, and that card showed up in a shuffle deck at that number. It was amazing. I've never seen anything like it before. That's the story that you really want people to tell, and any way you can get them to tell that uh, is good for you in your presentation. Okay, so the next uh, thing we're going to talk about is uh, the various experiences uh, that can be had with any card at any number and uh, the different variations that you can see. Uh, I've, I've kind of pinned this down to just a handful of different uh, uh, types, like I did with the Triumph video in my Comprehensive Triumph video. There's really just a few different types of this presentation uh, mechanically uh, that, that work. Uh, so we'll move on with that uh, in the next segment. Okay, so the various different uh, types of any card, any number uh, in presentation. Uh, I want to say at the onset here that I can identify the absolute worst version of any card, any number that I've ever seen. I can even name who performed it, and I'm going to name the person. Okay, and this is going to blow your mind here. But the very worst version of any card, any number that I've ever seen performed was performed by David Berglas. The worst version. I'll explain why here in a minute. Uh, and it's on video. If you go look, you'll find it on YouTube. I'm not going to link to it or anything, uh, but you can go find it. You'll actually find Berglas performing this uh, a number of different uh, times that, ca that was captured on video. But the worst version of the trick I've ever seen was performed by David Berglas. Um, you can't watch it and being uh, a magician, and quite frankly, you can't watch it being a layman and, 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 and not see right through it and see exactly what's going on and see that everything is violated in it. So the worst version ever that I've ever seen of the trick was performed by David Berglas. So those of you that are critical about the various different types of uh, methods to perform it uh, can go eat dirt because the, the worst version I've ever seen is actually performed by the man who was most famous by it. Now, the very best version of the trick that I've ever seen, the very best version that I've ever seen on video, again, these are on video, the best version I've ever seen is performed by a man by the name of David Berglas. And you might be thinking, well, how can that be? Well, two different videos. I, I've seen a version performed by David Berglas that is the kind of typical uh, holy grail kind of version of it where it meets all the criteria and uh, everything works out great. And it, it's, it's just absolutely astounding. And you, will, you could watch the video over and over and over and over and over and over and over again for a lifetime and never fully appreciate how it worked and how it happened. Okay, now this brings up an important point. If Berglas could do it one way, why wouldn't he do it that way all the time? And why is there this video out there that I've seen, and maybe you've seen too, that has the absolute worst iteration of it? How can that be? Well, the reason is because the very best version probably does not show you everything. The best version out there probably is not completely revealing as to uh, everything that happens inside of the, 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 the method. Uh, and some of you complain about this, I know, when you watch uh, Magic on television. Uh, you know, you're watching an episode of Penn & Teller's Fool Us, or you're watching one of these, you know, magic variety shows uh, that are kind of popular, uh, made popular again these days, which is kind of nice uh, to have these shows. But you're watching it, and you, you say, but I know how that works. I know how that trick work, works, and there was a camera cut. Or it was edited for time, and I know some other things happened in there uh, that are important to the methodology. Um, you know, that kind of thing <clears throat> really plays into the very miraculous kind of versions of it uh, that you might see out there. Uh, so that's why. Now, that being said, the very best version I've seen and the very worst version I've seen performed by the same man, I can tell you, did not follow the same methodology. One used a different method than the other. And I don't know what the method was for the very best one. I have a pretty good idea, and we'll talk about those methods here in a second. Uh, I have a good idea how the best one works, but I absolutely know how the worst one works. The worst one is so blatantly obvious. Okay, So here's how they looked. <clears throat> the best version meets all of the criteria completely. The worst one works like this. 
The cards are in the box at the beginning. Uh, Burgloss is in front of an audience. And by the way, I just want to say that what looks like the worst on video from what I saw probably came off as absolutely amazing to the people that were there. Uh, no doubt um, that it's not. Burgloss did not give a bad performance. The only thing unfortunate about the performance is that it was caught on video. Video is bad for magic. Um, video is bad for magic methodology because video causes us to limit the possibilities of our methods uh, such that review, the, the possibility of instant replay, does not allow us to get away with things that we otherwise can in a live setting. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind, that the very best version of this uh, for you to perform might not be one that you can show on video. Because if you show it on video, the method will be understood because of that replay and because of that possibility of review and the lack of control over the experience. So the worst version looks like this. Burglass has the deck out. It's in a box uh, sitting inside the card box at the beginning. Uh, and uh, he does something like this. He's got it sitting out there and he says, I need somebody to think of a card, any card at all. And someone names a card. Uh, I, I can't even remember. He might have even given some restriction to it, which off the bat to me is offsetting. You know, uh, don't think of the any of the aces. Aces are too easy. You know, people do that and they start to kind of limit down what the possibilities are. Uh, it, I don't think, it, from my recollection, it was even really a completely free choice of one out of 52. Uh, so spectator names a card. I don't remember what it was. Maybe they said seven of hearts. And then he asks someone in the audience to name a number, one out of 52, any choice they want. And they said something very low, like five. And Burgloss said, and this is where it starts to fall apart for me, and it becomes a, a bad presentation. Burgloss says, well, that's kind of too low. We need something, you know, better than that, a little bit higher than that, right? Uh, and then the person gave a really high number, somewhere in the 40s or, you know, near 50. And Burglass says, well, that's kind of high. We don't want to, you know, be counting and because it's kind of tiring counting. Just something kind of in between, right? So he, he kind of gripes to the spectator to get them into a choice that's somewhere between the teens and the 30s. Uh, and right there, we have a major limitation on what's being uh, selected. And that matters uh, in the methodology that he used, uh, that the spectator chose a number that wasn't really small or a number that was really big. Okay, so that was where it starts to fall apart. Now, to the layperson sitting there in the audience, they don't even remember the fact that that conversation happened. All they remember is that someone had a free choice of a number between 1 and 52 and they picked one. Okay, so that's the psychology of how this works. Now, the next thing that happens is Burglass goes over to the deck after the card was thought of and after the number was picked and Burglass opens up, he picks the, the box up. He takes the cards out, right? You remember the rules, right? How this is supposed to work. And he does this. He cuts a deck and he sets the cards down all the while he's talking about how the cards are shuffled. They've been sitting in plain view and he's not going to handle them. And he steps away from the deck after he, after he does that, and he says something to the effect of, the cards have been sitting in full view the whole time. There they are sitting right there, and I haven't touched them. I haven't touched the cards. And the, the, the phony baloney there is that he just touched the cards. Not only did he touch them, he cut them. Okay, right in front of the spectators. Then he has a, a spectator come up and they go through the typical dealing and they end up, of course, at the uh, selected number, uh, finding the thought of card and the trick is done and, and it's amazing to the audience. That's the worst presentation I've ever seen. And again, the, the problem with it is that it's caught on video. That's it. Otherwise, Burglis got away with it. He, he convinced the whole audience that all the rules were maintained, even though he violated Violated them. So as you're looking at methodology and you're complaining about what you have to do in order to pull it off, I want you to remember this story and maybe even go try to find that video and watch it. Um, just because you need to see that the man that was most famous for it uh, understood a very important principle that a mature magician, not a great one, but a mature magician should know. And this is the Common Magician Channel after all. This is not the professional magician channel. This is the common magician. But this is the lesson that the presentation is most important to the method. In fact, the presentation might be the method itself. Your presentation can be 
the method. That is very important as we look at methods. Okay, So the method may not necessarily require something difficult and complex and convoluted, but the method may be merely the presentation entirely. Uh, and that is what sells the trick. Uh, it may be a, a, a mental trick of the brain after all that helps us to work. Okay, So, Berglis never touched the cards. That's what he said. And that's what people believed, even though he set it up right in front of their noses. So, that is the worst version of it, and it was awesome. It's awesome to watch. It's awesome to see it happen. It's awesome to see him pull it off. It's awesome to know that uh, their minds have been completely violated by an excellent, superb performer. Um, so keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, next thing we're going to look at is the actual nuts and bolts, how these can be accomplished. Uh, so the different ways that we can do this uh, to, to make it happen. Okay, so all the while you have my presentation there at the beginning in the back of your mind, uh, thinking about possibilities, and we're going to get to that. Uh, we're going to talk about a number of different methods before we get to that particular method that I use there. Um, I just want to point out that my version does prove more than most other versions that are quite miraculous, and that uh, I shuffle the deck before it goes in the box, and, and there's a proof in there that the, the deck is shuffled. Uh, so we, we have everything accounted for. Shuffled deck, thought of card, uh, thought of number, uh, untouched, not handled, dealt face up, bada bing, bada boom, it works. Okay. All right, methodologies here. Um, the most um, complex, difficult methodology for this effect is one that I don't do and probably never will do and, and some of you probably do. Uh, and that is the use of a, uh, a stack. Now there's a diff there's different ways that a stack can be used and we're not really going to do that right here. Uh, we If you understand how it works is enough to understand how it works. We don't actually have to present it. You can use any stack that you want. When I say stack, it could be a size Stebbins stack. It could be a Mnemonica stack. Um, I don't have great f f fluency with either of those. I just don't use them. I use, you know, decks in use with very minimal preparation. If I prepare anything, if I stack anything, it's going to be something that I can stack in a cull or in a, a dead moment in front of the spectator to get set up. Okay, um, But you can use any stack. It could even be a new deck order stack. There's some variations of the trick that rely on that as well. Uh, so red, black, separation, new deck order, or numerical order um, stack. Uh, now, you can use the stack in one of two ways. You can use the stack with a confederate. Confederate is the true uh, terminology for stooge. Now, some people say that a good magician wouldn't use a stooge. Uh, yeah, that's not true. The best magicians use have used confederates, stooges. So... Um, if you go to the you know the very beginning of card magic, which comes from gambling uh, and card cheating and methods for cheating at, at uh, gambling uh, uh, games of chance with cards, um, the the use of a confederate is the bedrock principle in that uh, that you're working with somebody else. So um, the stooge thing is an awesome way to accomplish this feat. If you have a stack deck and you have a confederate who is giving the second piece of information, either the name of the card or the number, usually the number, but it could go either way, uh, then you have a foolproof way to perform this that will just absolutely blow the minds of anybody else watching. Uh, if I was doing this on television and I had the possibility of having a confederate, uh, someone who understood the stack and could name the number that the, the thought of card was at, I would totally do it that way. I would definitely do that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think twice about that because getting so, something like that on video, that can be seen by millions over and over again, you know, uh, in in replay online, uh, would be it's gold. I mean, it's it's just it's a pot of gold. It's it's you know it's a treasure right there uh, uh, for your for your reputation. So I definitely would do it that way. So that's one way that a stack can be used. The second way a stack can be used is to violate uh, the principle of not handling the deck. 
So if I have a stack, I can either just throw out that restriction and be the one that handles the cards and use my knowledge of the stack to get to two freely selected pieces of information, a card and a number, and then I can uh, uh, make my result come out that way, even if someone else is dealing, just by cutting the cards as Berglas did in front of people uh, in the worst presentation I've ever seen, as I said, uh, just like that, I could do it. Now, there's two ways to do that. One, as I said, is to just apparently handle the cards. A second, a very popular way now, is to do it in such a way that um, the cards are not apparently handled. Uh, and I don't think I'm really exposing anything by saying this, but uh, the, the uh, uh, Aussie Wind variation of this, and there's another one, I can't remember the name of the person that uses a um, uh, some gimmick... Uh, related to the card box itself. Uh, actually, a lot of setup, including the stack. But there are ways to handle the card box without handling the cards that shift the deck. So you're, you're essentially dealing with a stack and a shift. A stack and a shift. You have a stack where things are in a preset location that is known to the performer, and then the ability to shift the cards uh, in such a way that gets the stack ready for a count. Um, and you can do that from the box. Okay, So there are ways to handle that. I'm not going to expose how that's done. But in the act of dumping the cards out, you can actually shift the deck a number of different ways uh, uh, to do that. Um, one way has a, a heavily gimmicked box. Another way has a barely gimmicked, just a, a slight bit of preparation and just a lot of... Um, a lot of difficulty, we'll just say that, uh, to perform one of those. Okay, so you can violate uh, the rule of not handling the deck, the fourth rule uh, in Akon, by using a stack deck and handling the deck in such a way that it is completely unapparent to the audience by handling the box rather than the deck directly. Okay, so a stack and a shift or a stack and a confederate. Either of those two uh, can get you a, an absolute miraculous look at um, Akon. That is not what I did in my first performance, I'll say that at the onset. I did something different. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, another uh, way to perform this, then, uh, apart from the stack, would be uh, with uh, some kind of instant stack. A stack that is made on the fly so that you have three selections of a card and a number. Uh, and a stack is set up such that the count comes out good. Okay, so there are ways to do that. So it's a, we'll call it a partial stack. So let's look at that here in a moment. So we have uh, versions using a partial stack. Uh, and that is not a prepared stack, but one that can be uh, impromptu prepared in front of the spectators. Now, I will say that there are some uh, uh, stacked versions that, that use a transposition of halves. Uh, there's one marketed effect out there called Ice Cold Acon, and I can't really get into how it works uh, because it's a marketed effect. I don't want to really divulge that, but there are similar uh, well-known ways to kind of accomplish a, a, a similar effect or a similar methodology that are a partial stack and can be put together uh, in front of the spectator without having a full stack. Uh, and it works something like this. Uh, the card is thought of, but you usually by uh, presenting the cards out. You could have the ch card chosen, but the card is thought of in such a way that the spectator can have control, or rather the performer can have control over the selection. So they might say uh, the five of spades after looking through an open fan, and then the card is uh, somehow controlled uh, to a location in the deck so that it can be stacked up. Uh, in, in the process of um, uh, shuffling, it might be set up so that a certain number of cards are put on top of it. Let's say you have, uh, uh, the, you're putting it at the fifth position. Uh, so what I would do is I need to have a buffer underneath the card. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll take off my selected card, and I'm also going to peel off the bottom card to give a bit of a, a buffer there, a, a card that can be uh, hidden underneath it. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. So I would peel off the bottom and take my selected card, and then I would stack four cards 
cards on top of it. So I'd go one, two, three, four, five. So my card is now the fifth one down with uh, one buffer card underneath it. Uh, and then what I would do is I would uh, thumb off uh, one in jog and then I would shuffle off on top of that. So in this presentation, I'm giving up the possibility of having the deck uh, uh, not be handled by the spectator. I'm just throwing that out the window and I'm giving a uh, handling to it. Uh, what I would do then is I would pick up at my injog to create a break above my uh, stack. So I've got five cards to the selected card and then I've got one buffer card underneath. And now what I can do from this position is at some point I can get a half pass. I could either do a, uh, a Herman pass, half pass uh, at a dead moment uh, so that I get the cards turned upside down. Um, a another possibility is I might be able to get some kind of a Browry reversal in my overhand shuffle if I can manage that. But my goal here is that in front of the spectators at down time, uh, maybe as a number is being selected, I can do my half pass to get those cards facing the wrong way. Um, this is a very, very good method uh, uh, if you really want to make the end look clean. Now, I would not let somebody else deal the cards. I would deal them myself just so that I had some control over it, uh, but you'll see how this can come out in the end. Um, maybe I would do this as I'm having someone pick a number. So someone might select a number while I'm going through that shuffling and, and doing my half pass to get myself set up. Uh, and this is how it would be presented so that I could hide this. Uh, be better if there's a lot of people around uh, to hide that motion. But I'd say pick a number uh, 1 to 52. Uh, and I might, if they pick a small number like uh, 5, well, maybe if they said 5, I'd go with that. But if they said like 4 or 3, I would say, well, pick, pick a bigger number to make this look a little bit more interesting. We want to do a little bit of counting here. And then I'd have them go up higher. And if they went all the way up uh, near the top, that'd be fine. Now, one... Um one thing that I want to avoid is that if they picked 52, uh, that won't work because of my setup. I can't count down to 52. So I probably want to keep a buffer there to keep them uh, maybe lower than 45. If they get up to 45 or 46, I might say, well, that's that's kind of high. I don't want to count forever. Pick something else in between. So I might pull, uh, you know, the Berglas... <laughs> um, you know, refining of the number there. Hopefully they pick something somewhere in the teens, 20s, or 30s. So let's say they said 15. Now I know, or let's say 17, we'll make it a little bit uh, uh, mathematically more complicated. If um, uh, I'm already set up for five in on the bottom, what I would do is I would deal down until I got five away. So if they said 17, I would count out one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. Now at this point I know that I'm 10 away, 17, 7. I would count out 5 more, so I don't have to be a math genius to do this if I'm working groups of 5. So I got to 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now I know that I'm 5 away because I've counted my 10 plus, uh, uh, to, or I've counted up to 7 plus 5 more, so I'm 5 away. And at this point I would say, and what did you say? You said 17, is that right? And in this motion I would turn the deck upside down and set it back down, and then I can continue counting. Now, this only works because you can see my situation here as I've transposed my tops and bottoms. This only works with a bordered deck because you want to hide um, the discrepancy of the edges on the card. If you have a borderless deck, this won't work because you can see that the um, texture changes on the edges. It's also not safe. You want to make sure if you do this that your cards are absolutely flat. They don't have any kind of bend to them because this would might cause some swivel on it. So I get there and I count off my last five. So I got to 12. I would say, oh, by the way, I can do this face up too. I should have mentioned that. So this allows me to count face up. So I got there and then I count off uh, uh, 13, 14, 15. You got to be careful doing this. 16. And then I get to the 17th card and this is the chosen card. I've got one buffer card sitting there hiding that. Now the good news is that I'm not far away on my cleanup. Uh, I can pick up these cards and I can clean up in any way that I want. I can drop a card and pick it up, whatever the case may be. My cleanup is super simple on that.
Okay, um, so that's one way to do it. Um, you might even have this all set up at the beginning, and there's ways to do that. It would require you uh, to force uh, not the number, but force the card. Uh, and we'll talk about how to force a card here in a moment uh, to uh, do that. So that is one, a transposition of the deck with a stack that's made on the fly uh, in order to get a very clean deal. Um, a clean deal, I think, is probably the most important thing. Uh, having it such that you're not doing a funny move on the card that is selected is, is I think, vital to a very good presentation. Um, now, that's one method uh, to use a, an impromptu stack to get a clean deal down to the bottom. Um, we'll look at another uh, version here uh, using the same principle, uh, but this time we're going to put a shift into it. So if you have a really good shift or really good pass, you can do a similar kind of thing. You have your card selected, just like before, let's say it's the uh, the Ten of Hearts, and you want to get it controlled out uh, to um, a location that is, again, five down from the top. So if I get uh, my, my Ten of Hearts there, and I do an overhand shuffle, and I count off one, two, three, four, five in jog and shuffle off, I'm in a very similar position, but I don't have a buffer card underneath, and this is going to end me completely clean. Uh, I'll just pick up my break so that I can hold my break there, and then I would deal. I would deal down. You might even have the spectator deal a little bit uh, and then pick up the deck, give a spread, and then get your pinky break before the last five cards. But let's say they said um, uh, 24. Okay, so I would count off one, two, three. Oops, sorry, you can do it face up again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I'm ten away. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. I know that I'm five away now. And this is the point I would say. And what did you say? You said twenty-four. And then I might do my shift. So that was a uh, Herman pass with a tap on the table. Or you can just do a cleaner shift if you want to, uh, and then I would count off my last five card very cleanly. I might even say, go ahead, you, you count off the last five, uh, and you would go on from there, and you would get to the selection uh, very, very cleanly, and you would be totally clean at the end. So you could use a stack that is made ahead of time under a certain number uh, with a break, and then do a pass prior to the final cards being dealt. That's another very clean way to get a good deal at the very end. Okay, so those are uh, some ideas using uh, a stack deck, uh, both the uh, conceptually using a fully stacked deck uh, in those first examples we talked about, and then here two versions of an impromptu stack deck that use uh, two different types of slights. One is a transposition of sides, which is very easy to do. The other one is a transposition of parts using a shift, which also can be done very easily with the uh, appropriate kind of misdirection. In both cases, we're giving up uh, the ability to uh, not have to handle the cards. We'd have to handle the cards in both of them. Uh, so two ideas for you there. Uh, next, we're going to look at some other kinds of slights where, where we are substituting uh, the final card uh, in the deal. Uh, so again, this, this one would definitely require you to do all of the dealing in order to get to the end. We'll look at a few options there. So we're going to look at uh, substitutions, and most of these are going to be accomplished in the deal. But before I get into those, I want to show you, um, uh, quite frankly, I think it's one of the best ways to do this effect. And this is the way that I showed on one of the first videos that I um, posted to the channel that everybody hated. I mean, people really, really dogged on it, uh, and they were saying that anybody with half a brain would be able to see right through it. And I, I don't believe that's true at all. Um, I think that if you are good at your presentation, which is what the whole trick is about, again, this is just a force. That's all it is. It's a force of a card at a location. Um, or a force of, of uh, uh, data and choices, or both, um, it, it relies on your presentation to it, in order to make it, it pass. So uh, apart from replay on video, if you're performing live for people, which is what we ought to be doing, uh, then this method, I think, is extremely powerful, and it, it goes something like this. So this is a substitution, uh, but it's not a substitution of a card. It's a substitution of... Um, 
of uh, location, I guess you could say. And it works like this. You would have the spectator think of any card that they see. Again, you have to do it this way because in an impromptu version, you have to get control of a card. You have to control a card that is thought of. So a uh, card's facing up. This is the same thing as thinking of a card. Don't tell me that this is uh, a card, not any card. This is any card. They can pick any card that they want, and they can think of it. Uh, and they name it out. So let's say uh, you're going through and they say, oh, six of hearts. You say, good, there's a six of hearts. There's only one six of hearts in there. Again, any control that you do is good. Uh, I like to do an underspread call. That's my my favorite kind. You can see that I have it down here. Okay. So you call it to the top, you control it, the control of your choice, it doesn't matter. But you now have control of it in a location. You can even say we saw that it was somewhere maybe right about here in the middle. Uh, what we want to do is make it so that you don't know where it's at. It doesn't matter if I know where it's at, it just matters that you know where it's at. We're going to give it just a couple of shuffles. So uh, at this point you wouldn't know where it is at. So if I ask you to name a number, any number from 1 to 52, and they really can name any number, uh, let's say they say 13, uh, you would have them then deal. And you can actually have the spectator deal. Now the best way to do this is to have them deal into your hand and you do it like this. You start and show them. You have to deal them face down. So that's what you give up. So they're, it's going to be a face down deal by the spectator. You say deal them into my hand like this. One, two, three. Now I've already dealt the card into my hand. That's their choice card was on top. And they continue dealing four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 11, 12, 13. Now, you have a couple of options. The way I presented in the first video that I put out was to just leave it where it's at, and you can do a couple things. You can say, at this point, uh, as the cards are right now, the card at the 13th position, if this is all proper, should be the card that you were thinking of. And that's a, a kind of a mix-up in terms. It's kind of like the crisscross force, right? We're, we're substituting the bottom of the pack that was dealt for the position at 13 in the deck. Now it's 13 in the deck because of the way it's being held, and you can present it this way. Okay, so I, I swear to you, most people don't catch on to that, especially if your presentation is good. If you've got a number of people around, they're having a good time, there's a lot of laughing going on, there's things happening, there's misdirection happening, nobody's going to catch on to this. Okay, uh, you should try it and see for yourself and try a good presentation, see if that works. Now, if you don't like that and you want it to be more upfront, you have to do some dirty work here and it won't be as clean as it is uh, right now. So another option is to pass the bottom card to the top. So you have to do a shift in front of them. You can spread and then close up your spread and then do a pass where you're bringing it to the top. So any kind of pass that you want uh, and from the front that would look clean. So Herman pass, get it to the top and then they can show the card to be the one that's at the top. Okay, So that's a couple of possibilities. Another way, if you have a table, this one looks really good. Once you've done all the dealing, you can set them down and spread them away from the uh, deck. And you can say, now if we go through this, you can see the card at the 13th position. What this does is this disorients, uh, you can see in the mirror there, this disorients the fact that this was a pile that was counted out with this being the first card. And it gives a direction toward the deck to the 13th card and you can turn it over like that. So there's a lot of different presentations that are super clean that only require one control to get the card to the top of the deck and have it dealt out as being the first card. So those are possibilities. Now, to get to more direct substitutions, you can do, this is actually my favorite way to do it, not this way, but uh, a, a way related to this, is to do a, a bottom deal. Now, once the cards have been uh, dealt out into the hand, I have in my packet, and this works only with a small packet uh, to a large packet. You can't do it with just a couple of cards uh, or three cards. You need to have a, f a handful of cards in order to do this. Um, uh, but it would look like this. Once I have them, I would say, now this card in the 13th position should be your cards, and, th and, that, and that's when you do the bottom deal. Now, from this point of view, you can see the bottom deal clearly, but if you look out there, if I say this card should be your card, and I do the deal, it looks pretty legit, okay? So this card here, the 13th card, should be your card, and that's when you do the bottom, and you substitute in. Okay, now if we put this into the context of uh, the way I perform this for people, now this is the way that I perform it for people, this is not like it's done on the video that you saw at the beginning, but it involves a bottom deal substitution. Now the one hang up on this is that it's not clear 
clean because it doesn't allow the spectators to deal. It doesn't allow the spectators to really handle the cards. You have to do all the handling. And it requires that a dirty move be done at the moment when people would expect it. And that's a real bummer. That's the one thing I don't like about doing it this way, but this is how I do it. I would have them think of a card uh, just as normal. Uh, they would uh, say, maybe say the uh, Jack of Clubs. I would say, you can see that there's only one Jack of Clubs in the deck. I do my control to the top of the deck. I say there's no uh, uh, duplicates in there. There's only one. We can see that it's probably right about here in the deck. Uh, but it's important that you don't know where it's at. So if I give the deck a few shuffles, uh, you should lose track of it. Now, it doesn't matter if I know where it's at. It just matters that you know where it's at. Uh, and by this point, you should be completely clueless as to where the card is at inside of the deck. Um, no idea at all, which is perfect. So now I need you to name a number. You're going to do this trick. And they might say something like uh, 13. Now if it's less than 15, I'll say, perfect. Uh, we're going to make this even more interesting. I want you to go ahead and cut the deck about halfway. Uh, and they would cut the deck and I would say, now this is the new top of the deck. So this was the old top. This is the new top. You selected it. Uh, and if we count into the deck, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and this is the 13th card, and you do the double deal, uh, or the bottom deal, and you bring it off. Now, the cool thing about this is that you could actually deal them face up if you wanted to. You could deal them kind of a stud deal. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then this is the 13th card, which is the one that was terrible, but this is the 13th card, uh, the one that you selected. Okay, so you can do a bottom and stud. I don't do it very often. I usually would do this uh, as a regular deal. But you can point to it, take the bottom, pull it out, stud deal, there it is. Uh, so that's a good way to perform it, but you have to have control of the cards. The substitution is done at the moment when they would expect it. It involves a tricky move there that you'd have to master fairly well. Now, the reason why I would have them cut the deck uh, under 15 is that a bottom deal is a lot easier to achieve if you have a small pack. You could do it with a full pack. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then this is 13. You could do it that way, uh, and you could come off clean. But once you get up to about... Uh, 15, 16, 17, somewhere around there, this is a small pack and it's easier to accomplish. The hang-up is when they say something like 10 or 5, in which case you really want to have that cut. So I say the cutoff for me is about 15. If it's anything 15 or less, I'll have them cut the deck and then I will uh, bottom deal it from the, the second half. If they say anything over 15, then I'll deal off the top and then do my bottom from, a lo from the, the larger pack. It's a little bit easier to do. Okay, so that's how I present it. If I'm going to do this nine times out of ten, I'm going to do it just like that. Um, you know, I have a, a decent bottom deal that people don't detect, and uh, that's the way I, I get away with it. Um, I'm trying to think of, of other ways to do this. Uh, you could also force the card in a substitution uh, by doing a, a crisscross force. So rather than ask for a card, or rather a, than ask for a number, say, look, you can cut off as many cards as you want at any number that you want. Go ahead and cut the deck, maybe somewhere around in the middle. You want the packs to be somewhat even. They would do that, and then you do the crisscross uh, uh, placement here, and then you recap, and you say, now we thought of any card that you wanted to. There's only one in the deck. That's from a shuffled deck, uh, and then I allowed you to cut at any number that you wanted to, uh, and you cut to this location. In fact, the number of cards you cut off was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, uh, and you can see that all these cards are not your card, whatever the case may be, uh, and you could have... Um, uh, well, actually, I have that backwards. You would want to force the top card. Uh, you could force the bottom card by counting through it like that and showing it. Uh, or if you have it set to the top without uh, controlling it back to the bottom, you could then show this card as being their card. So you could count from their cut into the place where the card would be. Now, the gag there is that they cut off that number of cards, not this number of cards. So it's just a crisscross force. Like I said at the beginning of all this, Akon is a force. That's all it is. It's a force to a location, either using the data that they selected freely, a card and a number, 
or by forcing the card and the number, one or both, or all three, location, card, and number. Um, so that's that's a, a way to substitute as well. Another substitution is to have their card controlled to the top, so uh, they pick something like the uh, two of spades, you get it controlled to the top, and then you do a substitution at the very end. This is, a, I believe it's called a shinobi control, uh, which is a substitution. It looks like this. You count off from the top to their number, let's say it's 13, again. You count off the first one, which is the selected card, and then you count all the rest of the cards underneath that card uh, down to the number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And when you get to the thirteenth card, you pick it up, you turn over the packet, and you take off the uh, top card, which is the force card. And up to speed, it looks like this. So if you've counted out, and you have the cards sitting out in the open like this, so that uh, all the other cards are jogged underneath, the way you're pulling them in with your fingers, uh, you push out the card of interest here, uh, you pick it up, turn it over, and you say, there it is. So it's a substitution at the end. That's another way. Now that, again, involves uh, full control over the deck. So a uh, card substitution. You can substitute the count to the, to the uh, card of interest by handling the deck and giving up on that aspect of the, uh, um, of the presentation. By handling the deck, you can substitute at the last moment the card of interest with the um, uh, a force card uh, that had been thought of or selected and controlled. Uh, so that is another good presentation of it. Now, my guess is most of you are going to be in, interested in that kind of a presentation. Those of you that think there need, you know, those of you out there that think there needs to be moves involved in this, that's the kind of thing you're going to want to do. That or uh, the shift principle where you're shifting into a stack. Okay, uh, so we have up to this point we have a stack with a stooge or a shift. Stack with stooge or shift, one way or the other, okay, using a stack. And you have the uh, name of a card and a number actually freely given. Uh, the second method was a small stack that is set and is either shifted into place or substituted by uh, inversion, Okay, so side transposition, and that way it can be counted. So at some time during the count, there's a transposition going on uh, into the stack that you've made. Uh, that's the second method. The third method is a substitution on the card of interest at the moment that you come to it. Uh, so that's the other one. And then a, a subtle variation of that is a substitution of the sides of the packet, which is a real favorite of mine that most people defame and think is stupid. It is not stupid, I'm telling you. You do it that way, and you're going to fry a lot of people, especially with good presentation. So those are all of the methods uh, that I can think of. Uh, it's just a force. This is, you know, a way to do it with um, a full uh, a, a shuffled deck that's in use, uh, doing a substitution or a small stack like that uh, in a transposition of sides. Um, so uh, those are those are my ideas. Next, we're going to look at some other variations of a force that can get you to uh, the location. Now, a lot of you aren't going to like these, but these actually fly pretty well with most people. Okay, so we already covered the crisscross force as a method of cutting into uh, the deck to force uh, the card of interest. You can use any force. Like I said at the beginning, this trick is just a force. It's all it is. So it's either a force of the uh, card, a force of the number, a force of both, or it's a force of location or a force of all three. And I'm actually going to show you a presentation of a force of all three in a moment here, which is a really, really good one. Um, uh, and I won't say much more about that until we get to it. But you can use any force you want. So let's say that a card of interest is uh, uh, named, and it's freely thought of from a spread, which is a thought of card. It is not a picked card. This is not a card at any number. This is a thought of card at any number. This is a card, any card at any number. Don't be confused by it. Okay, I can't drill that home fa uh, enough here. Uh, but they select a card, you control it. Let's say they say the five of diamonds. You can use any control you want. I love the spread call, as you know. Okay, I get it to the top. At this point, I can use any kind of force that I want. I don't have to ask for number. I can merely just force to a location. So one way is to do my favorite uh, call force. I just called it out for the control. I can do a call force. After doing some shuffling, 
to lose its location. Actually, I still have it on top. I can tell the spectator I'm going to spread the cards out like this uh, to, uh, to a, a location I want you to pick. So one way I like to do it is to just spread like this. Spread out uh, four and different cards on top, talking about how you're going to spread it. And then place it back on. So now my card of interest is the fourth card in. Uh, so it's actually the fifth card in under four. And now I do my spread four. So I spread out four cards. I call my card of interest underneath and I maintain it in the spread. I have them put their finger out and they select any card they want. And I say this one right here, this is the one you want. And then I just square it up underneath. And I say, look, you have selected a card at this point, uh, the one right here. It, it was freely selected and that is down to uh, this position. One, two, three, four, five, six, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. And at the 36th position, you can see none of these cards were your card, but at the 36th position, the one you picked is your card. You could even have them deal it if you wanted to, uh, and that can look pretty strong too. So it's just a force to a location using a call force without asking for a specific number. I'm still having them select the location. Uh, another way to do the same thing is to get it controlled to the top, just as we did before, and do some other kind of uh, force. So you say, I'm going to shuffle it uh, to lose track of where it's at, and we're going to give it uh, a couple of cuts. And what I've done is I've held a break above my top card, and I just do a riffle port force. I say, go ahead and tell me when to stop. They say, right there. You do the riffle force, you break off at the location you want it to be, and you show that it's the one that they had. Or or you can break off and you can have them count out these cards and say, and at this position, this is the one you stopped at, that's it. So just a riffle force is fine. Uh, a cut deeper force is a good one too. So you can do the cut deeper force, it's controlled to the top after some shuffling uh, to lose track of where it's at. And you say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to cut off a portion of cards, a small portion, and I want you to turn it over. And then I want you to cut off a larger portion. I want you to cut deeper and turn that over. And as you go through the cards, the first place that you come to that's face down, I want you to show it. And that is the card that you cut to. That is your card of interest. So uh, you cut to it. You found the location. So any kind of force that you want to, uh, you can do. If you get it controlled to the bottom, you could do a simple Hindu shuffle force, right? You can say, tell me when to stop right here. This is the location. Uh, I want you to know that you could have stopped anywhere you wanted. It's none of these cards, but we stopped at this location, and it's your card of interest. Whatever kind of force is passable, and the assumption is, is that any good force would be passable with the right presentation, can be a reveal of any card at any number. Um, we're just substituting in our force in some way for the selection of a specific number. By doing the count, you can then insert a number that was freely selected, not by its name, not by its uh, uh, announcement of uh, as a number, but by its selection and location. So this is a way that we don't think about any card at any number. Um, this distinction of a card at any number, right, is, is kind of the inverse of what we're talking about here. Rather than talking about a card versus a thought of card, we're talking about any card at a number. Not necessarily a chosen number, but a chosen location. What's the difference? Okay, there's really no difference to a spectator. To them, it's all the same. So those are some options for you. If you know some good forces, you can force a location from a freely selected card that's been controlled. And it's still any card at any number. It's the same thing. It meets all the criteria, all the standards, even especially if you do a force that allows them to deal out cards down to the locations they selected. No discussion of this sort would be good without a quick uh, mention of equivocate force. Um, it is a lot easier to equivocate force a card than it is to equivocate force a number. You probably could do a number, but a one sense is w in, in which you could use equivocate is to get a card that seems to be thought of by narrowing down to a selection. Uh, and I have a, a couple of videos on there that deal with equivocate on my channel uh, where I use it as a solution uh, to some methods. If you look back in my um, uh, guest 
guess the method series, there's one that I do in there with the Hofzinser card uh, that is a, an equivocate uh, force of a, a card. Uh, so that is to narrow down through questioning to a specific card uh, that is going to be used as the force card. Now, a lot of people will catch on to that, but you'd be surprised in certain circumstances where people don't. Uh, so that is one force that's worthy to at least get to a card. Now, I also want to say no discussion on this would be uh, complete uh, now that we've talked about forces uh, and the power of using simple forces to accomplish the effect. If you're doing that, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't maybe in your presentation just try to get lucky. Uh, so no, no conversation on this would be complete without mentioning that, that you say, you know, I want you to, uh, there was a man by the name of David Bergloss. He did this trick called any card at any number is just an amazing effect. We had cards inside of a box and they were shuffled and you can start that way and do everything and say, uh, you know, I want you to freely think of a, a card and they say a card. I want you to freely think of a number one to 50 to say it. Uh, and then you have somebody take the cards out and you have them deal down in anticipation, right? And you could say like the, the, the five of spades at 11, right? And, and someone else would deal face up. Um, um, oops, sorry, that's a double backer. Let me get that out of there. A couple jokers. Um, that was embarrassing. Uh, they would deal down, what did I say, 11, and I forgot what I said, five of spades, something like that. So they would deal down 11. One, two, three. And you can see here that, uh, 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 you know, I'm not David Bergloss, right? So you could try to do it and see what happens. You don't know what's going to happen, right? And at this point, if it fails, you say, of course, it's all a myth. It's all a myth. It's a legend. And then you can say, but what if... What if we really could do it? And then go into the method of your choice, right? But why not try to get lucky? I just want to say that it's known to happen. It's only 1 in 52. Don't forget the real odds of it. Uh, the odds that any particular card would be at any particular number is uh, the chances are 1 in 52. Those are terrible odds, but they're, 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 they're there. I mean, it can happen. I once tried this over and over again, uh, and I've done it a couple different times. One time, I've done it twice, okay? I, I, one time I got up to 32 times, and I didn't get there, uh, so I gave up after that. Another time I did it, and on the fifth time, I kid you not, the fifth time the card that I named and the number that I named was, was it. It lined up. So if it's just part of your presentation to maybe get lucky, why not do that? Now, the key is, is that if it happens, if you get down to that card uh, and it is the card that was named, it's the ace of spades at whatever, you know, the, the, the key there is to not freak out and say, and that's any card at any number and be cool and be done. That's it, okay? And you actually just then performed the miracle, and you'll be remembered for it. Um, you know, people will tell that tale. So there's, there's a sense in which I have to mention this. Maybe part of your presentation is just getting lucky, just getting lucky at it. Uh, and one idea is I know you can take a cards that are often called out, like a queen of hearts. Uh, you know, find a queen of hearts and just kind of plan for this. Stack a queen of hearts at a location that might be common. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, stack your queen of hearts at a location that might be common, like around 15. Okay, so you put the, the queen of hearts at the 15th position or whatever, and now you have a stack. So if you get lucky and someone names the queen of hearts, you're halfway there. You have some control. Now you can push someone either into the number. If they say, you know, uh, 42, say, well, just pick something a little bit, you know, why don't you pick something lower so we're not dealing a lot. And if they get near 15, you're just a shift away from, from fixing your position, either taking cards away or putting cards down. Uh, if they say 15, you're there. You got lucky and you hit it. So you could plan ahead a little bit and just plan to try to get lucky sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, go with that as your first line of offense. Uh, and if it fails, say, it's just a myth after all. This can't really happen. But maybe it can, and then go on with your presentation and do something else, do some other method, uh, use some of those simple forces and just make it work. And now what you have is you have a circumstance where people think they saw something that they didn't see because you did all that explanation and you went through that presentation in the beginning. Uh, you know, just like David Berglas did on the worst version that I've ever seen on video, right? He programmed the audience to think they saw something that they didn't, and there it is. There, there you have it. So uh, just wanted to mention that. You know, get lucky. Try that. 
you know, uh, use use uh, some kind of chance there to maybe come out clean uh, and keep your cool if it works out, you know, and, and move on from there. Part of the chance presentation where you're just trying to see if, if it happens uh, can be that you have some latitude in where the number is at. So if you were uh, presenting it like this, that you're just going to see what happens uh, and you count off, let's just say uh, five of diamonds at seven. Uh, and you count uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it's not it, say, but it's unclear. Do we mean the seventh card or the next card after the seventh card? And then show it. And if it's not it, then you go on with your, well, it's just a myth thing. But you can give yourself a couple of outs uh, by by doing that, too. So just worth mentioning. It's something that even David Bergloss talks about in some of his writings on uh, Akon, uh, that you can have some presentations where you you change the odds by looking at the cards around it by having one less or one more. You actually can cut the odds down quite a bit uh, that it just happens, you know, by chance that it actually comes out right. So if you're doing the presentation by chance and you want to press your luck on that, hey, why not? There's no, nothing to lose by doing your presentation that way. Just remember that you have a couple of outs in the one before or the one after. If it shows up at six, uh, you know, it was supposed to be seven and you count one, two, three, four, five, six. And the sixth one is that you can say, and just before the seventh card, we see, you know, right, right at your number, we see the uh, uh, card you named, right? Or the the one after or the one on or whatever. So you can cut down the odds by doing that. It's also worth mentioning uh, that that's pretty amazing. If it comes out like that, you can uh, take your opportunity of luck and present it as skill uh, by doing that and, and become famous. So anyway, uh, just a thought there uh, if you're doing this by chance. So those are some other ideas. Uh, next, we're going to look at um, the kind of the top of the mountain here, uh, and we're going to force everything. We're going to force everything. And I want you to see how this can be done and why this is an awesome way to do it, especially if you have to do this on video. Uh, I'll show you here in a moment. Okay, so this is the um, this is the top of the mountain here. We're going to force everything, and I'm going to show you how powerful this can be, especially in the right circumstances uh, when being recorded on video. Let's say that you're doing a performance for people. You record the whole performance, and then you give a presentation online, and you show it. Or let's let's say that you're doing this in a studio, a news studio, uh, and uh, you do some work during the um, commercial break to kind of make things move along more quickly under that pretense, and then you present the trick. Uh, it can work something like this, where you're forcing some information on people for them to be thinking about, and then that gets presented in a different context uh, as uh, freely thought of items. Okay, so this is how you can do it. You force everything. Uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to force this card. I'm going to force uh, the Eight of Hearts on someone. And, I, and I'm going to say, here's what I want to do. I want to uh, select a card, but I want to say, now this wouldn't be out in the open. This would be unknown to people. You say, I want to select a card, but I want it to be totally free. I want it to be a completely random selection. Uh, I want to make sure that there's no way that anybody could have uh, caused you to pick this in any way, shape, or form. So uh, what we're going to do is very simple. Uh, and you're just going to do uh, a shuffle. And then at the end of the shuffle, and you can see from the back, what's going on here. At the end of the shuffle, uh, we're just going to uh, cut the deck here real quick. You can probably see what happened there. And uh, I'm just going to take the first card, which is an eight. So we'll use that number. We're going to use the number eight. Uh, and then I need to get a suit. So uh, not the clubs, but uh, we, we want some other kind of suit. So um, that's actually the jack of clubs. We don't want that. That's a club. Uh, but we have a four of hearts, so we're going to take the heart. So uh, we want the eight of hearts. That's the card that we're thinking of. Now, I just forced the eight of hearts from something that seemed very innocent and random. Okay, This is a legitimate force. It comes out of uh, Animan. Uh, this is one of the 202 forces. Uh, it's a great way to force either a card or to force a number. In fact, we're going to follow that up, and we're going to force a number. I could shuffle again. Uh, by the same method, which we'll talk about in a moment, or I could just continue on and say, we need to get a number, so let's get a number here uh, using some of the number cards in the deck. Uh, the next one we've got, we have a four, uh, and we have uh, a jack. Uh, we'll keep the jack out of it, that's not a number card, but we've got a three, we've got a nine, so we got nine seed. 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So we've, we've uh, forced the number 16 here because this was in a stack that's prepared. Okay, so 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 is the number, and 8 of hearts is the card. So all I would need to do is that from this point down, I need to have my 8 set in at the 16th position, and I just need to do some false overhand shuffles. That's all I have to do in order to get myself to the data that I want. So with that in mind, I'm going to show you the presentation that we had at the beginning of this. And I just want to show you very quickly. All you have to do is have your stack here at the beginning and do a false overhand shuffle with just the bottom stock of cards. So I'll jog off one and jog. I'll shuffle off fairly. I'll reach up. I'll get my break. I'll shuffle off fairly to my break. Uh, and then I will throw on top. And then I'll do a false cut to the table and I'm set to do my forces. So let me show you that performance that you saw at the beginning of this video one more time with everything in there. Everything that happened before the break and the cut to the shuffle and the placement into the box. This would be everything that happened before the cut, the video cut on the video that's shown on YouTube, before uh, we come back from the studio break, the commercial break, to the presentation live. And I ask two people to say, and you're thinking of a card, something that was forced to them, and you're thinking of a number, and then I present everything to you. If I was doing this on video, I would do it just like this. Take a watch, see what you think. I have here a deck of playing cards. It is uh, a shuffled deck of playing cards. Uh, and what we're going to do is a, a little bit of an experiment here. Um, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to uh, get a card and a number. Uh, and it doesn't really matter uh, what card and what number. Uh, but we want to make sure that it's a, a completely randomized carded number. Uh, so what I want to do here is from, uh, from the deck, give it a cut. From the deck, we're just going to select some cards to help us come up with a completely randomized card. Rather than just picking one, we're going to think of one, uh, think of a card that is um, randomized by the deck itself. So uh, what we're going to do is just going to take a couple cards off here and see what we get. Two of uh, diamonds. So we're going to take the two, number two, and we need to get a suit. So we're going to have a two, obviously not the two of diamonds, but we're going to have a, a suit. So we'll take the next one. That's a diamond, so that won't work. Let's see what we get here. Spades. Okay, so two of spades. Two of spades is going to be the card that we're going to think of. In fact, uh, you, sir, I want you to think of that so that we don't forget it. So two of spades, you are thinking of the two of spades. Okay, we need a number as well. Um, <clears throat> There's 52 cards in the deck. Uh, we don't need a really big number, uh, but we just need a randomized number. Uh, so we'll count the number cards uh, as, as uh, uh, some numerals here to add up to get a number. Let's see what we have here. Five, um, seven. Okay, we won't use that one, that face card. And six. And we'll go with that. So five, seven, six. Um, that gives us what? Uh, 18. I think that's 18. Yep, 18. Okay, so we have 18, uh, 2 of spades, and 18. Okay, so remember that. We need to remember, you sir, you're going to remember 2 of spades, and you ma'am over there, I want you to uh, remember 18. You're thinking of the number 18. So uh, there's a very, very famous uh, uh, magician uh, by the name of uh, David Burgloss. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before. Uh, but he would do uh, a very fascinating trick, uh, and the trick would uh, involve a, a thought of card, completely random thought of card, and a completely thought of uh, random number, uh, a random number thought of, and, uh, and a deck of cards that was shuffled inside of a, uh, the case. So we have a shuffled deck sitting inside of the case. Uh, and the experiment would go as this. Uh, the, they would take the, the deck out. Uh, somebody else would take it out. Uh, not, not the performer. And uh, inside of the uh, deck, without shuffling it, without cutting it, without doing anything else, uh, they would locate a card at a number. So we need to get a card. And you're thinking of what card are you thinking of for us? The two of spades. Thank you very much. Uh, and we need a number, so ma'am, what, what number were you thinking of for us? 18. So we have the two of spades, 
at the 18th card out of a, a deck of 52. So I would need someone to uh, deal this out. So without cutting, without shuffling, without doing anything, we would count out from the top very cleanly. In fact, we'll do it face up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. And this is the eighteenth card. And what uh, card are you thinking of? The two of spades. Two of spades. That is any card at any number. Completely random card at a completely random number uh, from a shuffled deck. So you can see how a magic trick really works. This is how magic tricks work, people, okay? They, they require elaborate planning and presentation only of the things that you want spectators to see. And in the case of my version of this that you saw at the beginning, the spectator is you. It's you people that are watching a video. It's not anybody that's sitting here. And if I did this live with people, it's not the five people that I did the trick with in the presence. I mean, I did a trick for them, and it's just as amazing to them. But my real audience is you people watching my edited video that's only showing part of it. Uh, it's just the people watching at home uh, on the part that the uh, news station shows on my time in the studio. When the camera turns on after that commercial break, after some things have been selected under the pretense of getting this trick to move quicker. OK, um, it's just what I want you to see. That's the trick. That's how all tricks work. That's how every trick works. So if you want a really powerful Akon that you're going to be remembered for online, do what I did and post it out there. Right. With people. Put it out there. Uh, if you want to do uh, something, you know, on television that people are going to see, do what I did or use or use a confederate, use a stooge with a stack. Do whatever it takes to get the best result on video to make you look great. And if you're not going to be doing things for video, which most of us really don't have an interest in, let's be honest, I gave you a whole bunch of other ways to perform the effect using mechanical means, uh, by, by using a, 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 a stacks that are made on the fly, by using side transposition, by using a shift or a pass in order to uh, uh, shift to a stack in the middle of counting uh, so that uh, things can be counted fairly. Uh, I showed you card substitutions using a bottom deal or using uh, some other kind of substitution principle or by using some other kind of force. Uh, I showed you a number of ways to get there. So use the controls that you already know. Use the substitutions that you already know and go perform a good Akon. Uh, you know, perform a good any card at any number. Any card in the deck can be thought of or selected in the right circumstances. Any number can be thought of and given under right circumstances. Or any location can be pointed to and used as a reveal. Um, you know, the information, so far as the spectator knows, is up to them to give to you, and the odds are ever, ever the greater uh, as that original presentation that we try to meet with those uh, uh, criteria. So anyway, that's my comprehensive um, video on Akon and the various methods that are used without, uh, you know, divulging some of those marketed effects. I show you a lot of great ways to get there, um, and I uh, wish you the best of luck with this and happy magicking.